Yeah, thanks for the warm welcome. I um, hope everyone is super motivated for the next coming days and for the next like 25 to 30 minutes, I will dive into everything observability, everything I learned with eBPF, also with chaos engineering, some ideas. Um, this is me. You will find me on the internet as DNS Michi, which is DNS M I C H I. I learned that later on that this doesn't really work in English, that nickname, which works in German. Um, but I'm everywhere on the socials if you want to connect, talk more about observability, um, DevSecOps, and GitLab, of course. So I'm a de uh, senior developer eventually at GitLab since three and a half years now. And I enjoy everything observability. Today, I will share a lot of things with you. And I've intentionally put the QR code on the slide. So if you want to, like, learn later on async, or you say, Michael is talking way too fast today, take a picture. Um, the slides are on the internet already. And um, you can also like learn in my newsletter if you want to, because there will be a lot of things around new terms around um, eBPF programs, what are Berkeley packet filters, what is like the kernel, maybe a little bit of kernel development inside, programming languages, security, chaos, breaking everything, DNS, Sometimes, because it's always DNS, the problems. Um, hence my nickname. And um, yeah, but before we dive in, um, let's start with like, what is observability? How did we land there? And what are like the differences to like traditional metrics monitoring? And I, I tried to come up with my own definition of observability, moving a little bit beyond everything, like microservices, distributed architectures, like a service monitoring health state isn't really sufficient anymore. Um, and I also want to ask questions which I probably didn't know about yet. Um, and when I started debugging some CI/CD pipelines a while ago, um, I did see that the, the cost was raising. So infrastructure was com consuming more resources, cloud resources, and then you have like $1,000 um, or something on your bill, and you have no idea why. Um, and a little digging and a little more digging like brought me into, hey, every time I download something, there's a timeout or maybe a random timeout. And this timeout happens because DNS has certain latencies and the routing doesn't really match. Um, but I couldn't really figure that out. But because I had all the data in the observability system, I could correlate that and get an idea and like change the DNS server, change the CDN and the routing somehow. Um, and then the CI/CD pipelines went down to like 10% of the time again. And it was much more efficient, didn't waste money, didn't waste resources. And this is how observability can help that. Um, and it's kind of important to understand that. There are also different data types, and I call them data types. Other call them like pillars or something like that. I think it's like we have metrics, we have traces, we have logs. We will have, uh, we have profiling, and Open Telemetry um, also said they will be adding this as a, as a supported data type in the future, I think last week. You might have error tracking as observability data, real-time user monitoring, test reports, and if you go into network monitoring like NetFlow, network data, everything can be a certain type which can be correlated within observability. Um, we have different data sources, like probably known from a Prometheus exporter. We have metrics. We can have traces, either from code instrumentation or auto-instrumentation to some degree. Logs, whatever that means, like fetching that in the sidecar, collecting it everywhere. But these are all like user-level data sources. If we want to go deeper, we probably need something else, like fetching um, syscalls, network events, certain resource access which need a needs access on the kernel level. But like, as a developer, or I like as, a, as, a, as an SRE or ops engineer, kind of, how would I fetch these from the kernel level? And so I figured, like, I think one and a half years ago or two years ago, hey, everyone is talking about eBPF. And what, what is that? Extended Berkeley packet filter. Um, no idea what that means. Um, and why is it extended? So I watched a few talks and got, got insights into, like, OK, we, need to do, we can define the use case, like observability, security, networking at the kernel level, which sounds awesome in the beginning. But then it's like, hey, we need a stable kernel, because every Linux, we're operating somewhere in the cloud or in our infrastructure. This needs to run stable, and the kernel cannot like break something or put a little feature in, in there. So there's less innovation. And the idea then was like, OK, we're running the small programs 
um, as a runtime addition, so just like loading it into the kernel and then extending it to some degree, um, which sounded like a really great idea. But like, how do we get there? What are the use cases? Um, because I think it's important to understand the value of something because you want to use that, you want to solve a problem. So maybe high-performance networking on load balancing could be a thing in a Kubernetes cluster, for example. Um, for as a developer who had like fantastic performance regressions in my applications when released to the customers, um, performance troubleshooting could be a thing, application tracing, um, looking deep inside um, which I normally cannot do, security observability or other use cases or application runtime security. And there's a whole lot more to that. Um, and then I got th got, it got me thinking, okay, I can try to use all the tools, but if I want to create my own EBPF program, how does this work? And so, like, do I need to become a kernel developer? Do I need to, like, learn C? No, it, C is not enough. Um, the kernel expects bytecode. Um, then there's a verification, so it's like loading the program at runtime with just-in-time compilation and then compiling it to a machine-specific instruction set. I was like, I don't want to do that. Um, so maybe I want to have an abstraction layer in higher level languages. And um, then I was like, OK, where do I start? What is the best tutorial? Um, what could be an interesting research strategy? Um, and I collected a lot of resources during my research, which is like linked on the slide here. Um, and it always came back to Brandon Gregg's tutorial on learning eBPF tracing, which I think is from 2019, but still accurate to learn. Um, it, and it helped me to define the use cases, like exploring the tools, practicing a little bit, and then figuring out, hey, does, is this what I want? Um, how, does, how could it help me on my journey learning eBPF and figuring out more use cases? And one of the first things I tried was uh, the BCC tool chain um, for performance analysis. And the idea was really, for example, to use XXNoop, which allows me to trace when a binary is executed. And just to, like, to uh, simulate that, I ran an endless loop firing a ping command with like one ping. And then I got to see that executing XXNoop, which was the first like, success moment, um, having an eBPF program in the C dialect loaded in the kernel, and in the user space, it communicates using Python. Um, works, but maybe there's more to, to that. And then I found BPF trace. Didn't know this existed. I was always like using S trace and couldn't remember the, the uh, parameters. Um, and BPF trace, for example, allows me to see um, open calls. So when a program is writing a file, opening a file, I could see that. Um, so I wrote a little C program, which creates a file, and then closes it again, and was able to, to not only see that like, the file has been written, but libraries had been loaded. Because I was including the standard library, um, it tried to include uh, the, the libc, for example, in that example, um, which could also be a way to figure out, hey, my dependencies might be wrong, or some malicious activities or whatnot. Um, so added this to my list of when I have a problem, I want to debug something, BPF trace could be something which I really want to use. Um, and then the developer in me was, okay, but how do I start really like development with eBPF? And there's a couple of ways or libraries available on eBPF.io um, linked as well, which could, could be helpful, for example, with Go, with Rust, with C and C++. So these are like the main languages where you can compile them into bytecode for, for the eBPF program. Um, then you need a compiler, which is uh, either Clang or GCC, I think, in version 10. And the most important thing is like find a use case, which is fun to explore. Um, because you can like create the everything solving program, but this will take 10 years and you probably don't have much fun with that. But uh, like defining a use case, like a program is starting or ending, attaching to the, to the events or hooks, or maybe just network interface traffic monitoring to some degree, because probably every device out there has a network interface and a, and a kernel where it can load an eBPF program. Um, there are more abstracted libraries available, which is great. So for example, if you're using Cilium, um, they have their own Golang runtime library, 
there are also more examples to learn. For example, uh, network interface traffic inspection, um, counting the packets, building maps, and so on. So basically, like a TCP dump, but a little more deep down, um, which was a great way to interact and learn, and also figure out, hey, maybe I want to create my own eBPF programs with Go. And I was like, hmm, maybe there's a different language. I'm currently learning Rust. Um, and I found Aya-RS, um, which provides a book tutorial, has similar examples to learn, and provides the cargo tool chain, everything around, if, if you want to dive deep into that. And it got me thinking, OK, could be another way um, to create my own EBPF programs and dive deeper into that. Um, the problem is I cannot fit writing an EBPF program in this 25 minutes, so I created a workshop for a different event, which is linked here on the slide. So if you want to dive into learning this, I would recommend checking this out on, on o11y.love. Um, but yeah, now that I kind of stopped my turn and looked like, OK, I've seen how eBPF works. I, know, I understand what are the how, how the, the programs get loaded into the kernel. I saw some packets. Maybe let's look into the use cases. Um, what is out there already? There might be some, um, some good minds out there who had the same ideas as I did, but probably some years ago. And maybe there is something out there. And from eBPF, I, I want observability um, because, like, either Kubernetes is down or something else is down, and I yeah, can either take a coffee or play a game, build Lego or whatnot. Um, but I want to be productive. And I found a Prometheus exporter. There are also open telemetry collectors using eBPF. Um, could be using Pixie, which provides observability for developers. Um, for SREs, it's more like CoRoot, which um, uses eBPF to track the uh, network traffic between containers and then match that against the Prometheus state met, uh, uh, cube state metrics um, to create a service map, which is like interactive, like starting containers, breaking containers, and, and so on. Could also be an interesting use case. Or, from co or another use case, continuous profiling using Parker, um, which is also open source, which could be a great use case for observability in eBPF. I also want security. Um, because by default, things pro are probably not as secure as um, they're supposed to be. Um, maybe I want to uh, I use Cilium and also Tetragon for enforcing um, security observability. Um, Tracy on the other side from, from Arco Security also provides me with runtime security and forensics. Um, there's also Ferco in the CNCF landscape, probably the most mature for threat detection. Um, and there are different use cases in that. So um, our security team created a package hunter um, tool based on Falco to inspect what the containers are doing, downloading something with curl and pipe bash and have fun. Um, these kind of use cases come to life and are possible. And I learned that late that Falco also uses eBPF for that. Um, so this is a great use case in the security scope. If I'm changing my hat, and I have a lot of hats, um, to SRE and DevOps, you might want to check out Inspector Gadget, which is a collection of eBPF-based tools to look into containers, the different traffic, DNS resolution, things which are probably obvious on a single instance Linux machine. Um, but in a distributed container cluster, it's much more like, hmm, I have no idea what's going on. Inspector Gadget might help with like unveiling that. Um, other examples in that area are Caretta, similar to CoRoot, creating service dependency maps, or even like eBPF is great, but how do I distribute that? This small .o whatever file, and the folks from Solo created Bumblebee to distribute eBPF programs, which is another area of maintenance, um, which I also want. I don't want to like compile something and it doesn't work on the other system. Um, but for observability, I also need storage. So I have a lot of data types, time series, logs, traces, eBPF events, everything. And the challenge is now, can I store that in Elasticsearch? Can I store that in Prometheus, Cortex, or Thanos, or something else? Maybe I write my own storage, probably which you get 
from uh, vendors in the enterprise segment um, where they built something like that. And then the question also is like when you're troubleshooting an incident, which data do you really need? Is it like the one year scope or is it one day or one, one week? Um, which also leads to how to plan efficiently, like cost efficiency or capacity planning, forecasting what, what resources are actually needed and how much of these are reserved for observability. Yeah, and observability without alerts and, and visualization doesn't make much sense. So when service level objectives are violated, want to do something, want to get triggered, want to correlate things, analyze, but also suppress. So getting pinged that something is broken all the time. At some point, I want to acknowledge that I'm working on that. Um, yeah, and use all the different things, um, which brings me to, okay, everything is green by default, or not green, but everything is working and healthy, but I really want to break that. And especially the tools which are using probably different data collection methods with eBPF, I want to verify the, the reliability with that. And the best thing to break things professionally is chaos engineering, what I learned in the past. Um, so I thought of, okay, how can I leverage chaos engineering um, with different types to really break the systems? And one of the SRE methods or insights is using golden signals like latency, traffic errors, and saturation. And, and from there, I can slow, slow down HTTP traffic, I can perform CPU pressure on things, I can break DNS if I want to, and then I get to see how the application and the deployments are behaving. So this is one way where chaos engineering works the same way as it, as it did before, so eBPF doesn't change anything. Um, for metrics, there is an eBPF uh, collector for, for Prometheus uh, developed by Cloudflare for high performance and high scaling environments. Um, I can break that in a similar way using CPU, I.O., memory stress, and delays. Um, if I'm using a collector and I want to verify that the graphs are not like going up and green all the time, but really get to see how the system is behaving. Open telemetry on the other side also started implementing eBPF with, uh, with collectors for different types um, for the kernel in the cloud in Kubernetes. So this is a relatively new project, um, which offers a way in the middle to ingest all the, da the data being collected and enrich it. And I think either send it to Prometheus or Open Telemetry itself. Um, and the same idea applies here with like increasing the CPU stress, memory stress, having network attacks and whatnot. So it's a useful tool and you can break it with existing um, ideas. For, for profiling, for example, um, and this is a screenshot from, from Parker, from, from the demo system, um, when I want to see that the call stack or many functions are being executed um, and really figure out, hey, there could be a potential deadlock, a potential problem, like putting the system on CPU or memory stress is probably the easiest way to do that, or injecting some low latency connections um, to really see, oh, maybe the service isn't connecting, retrying, and the call stack goes up a million times um, to really get to see, oh, I could actually optimize my application based on that scenario. Um, for Kubernetes observability, I've mentioned CoRoot before, and this is a screenshot from CoRoot showing a service map. Maybe um, the service map should show me like there is too much traffic going on, maybe there's a breakage involved. Um, I really want to have a service health state overview, not in the sense of everything is green, everything is working, but it should be like random blinking, breaking, um, and I get to verify that the data is actually collected the right way and it's not pretending everything is working. Um, but security observability and, and chaos engineering, it's kind of really like, it's a given fact. Um, it brought me, or like researching for the talk, brought me into security chaos engineering and how it relates to eBPF. Because I really want to, for example, verify security policies, um, for example, using Kuverno Open Policy Agent in Kubernetes, um, and inject something which simulates a privilege escalation, for example. Or there might be some multi-tenancy data guards uh, um, there, 
um, and I simulate potential access with security chaos engineering ideas in that regard. Um, and I, when I tried Tracy, I learned it can also detect rootkits. And I had no idea that rootkits even existed on Linux. Um, but I found, it, found an actual rootkit which can be installed, which hides itself and overrides some sys calls and some events. I was like, I have no idea what, what happens. And then I read, ah, oh, you can get root on the system with that. Um, it hides itself, but Tracy is even capable of finding that, that something has overwritten or hooked the syscalls. And if you see um, the, the red marked, I'm not sure, yeah, you, you probably can see that. Um, if it's there, there's probably something harmful in your system. It might either be compromised and you should shut it down from the network immediately and um, inspect what's going on even further. And um, thought about, okay, this could be an attempt for potential chaos in as well, like injecting some syscall hooking and verifying that Tracy actually works that way it's supposed to be. Um, Cilium Tetragon on the other side, um, provides an abstraction layer and a security policy DSL, so I can define which syscalls or events should be prohibited, like writing a file or something like that. I think the most easiest way to trigger that is trying to write etc um, the, the etc password file, for example, and get to see whether Tetragon kills the process or not. But I could also install the uh, Diamorphine rootkit, uh, which I I didn't do that intentionally, but I installed it on a Hetzner Cloud virtual machine and forgot about it. Um, and then I got an email from the ISP saying, telling me, yeah, port scanning something. Um, and I looked into it. Tetragon was still running, and I saw, oh, there are many fantastic program names, um, opening ports and things. Tetragon was able to tell me about this. Um, so I figured, okay, this could also be a potential way of simulating a rootkit, testing Tetragon. The problem is, I don't, I didn't really understand what the rootkit was doing. It did some syscall um, overriding and hooking, um, and it got me thinking, maybe there's a way to create this small snippet or this small program, load it in the production environment, and then do chaos engineering based on that, verifying that the tools are actually detecting that. I wouldn't recommend installing the diamorphine rootkit in production, because then this is really unwanted chaos engineering. Um, but it's an interesting idea to like how to uh, do a verify my security systems, um, which brought me to some, uh, some more ideas to break things with eBPF and chaos engineering. Um, so something like having an eBPF probe, a small program, which then injects some syscalls and changes responses. So with eBPF, I can look into a decrypted TLS um, conversation or connection, and I can actually like, change the data which is exchanged. I can also change DNS. I can draw packets. Um, I might be able to access protected data, depending on um, what, what the kernel allows me to do. So there are safeguards in the kernel, but to some degree, if I'm not doing too many malicious things, I might be like dropping a packet at random. Um, then I looked into how Chaos Mesh, and this is a chaos engineering tool in the Cloud Native landscape, how DNS Chaos is implemented there, um, which is a plugin, and it needs core DNS in the Kubernetes cluster. And I thought maybe this could be replaced with an eBPF program, um, and I'm just like injecting DNS records with different IP address responses, injecting NX domain, something else. Um, but it's a little too complicated, um, and I'm, I'm not sure how to implement. I found some examples with Express DNS and how it's implemented in eBPF and C code, but it, it wasn't that compelling. Um, and I thought of maybe there are different ideas which, which is much, much easier to simulate and give me some effect, um, like simulating the rootkit, um, calling home like curl pipe bash could be some in, something interesting. CPU stress, maybe, no idea. Um, DNS chaos somehow, and then I figured I learned e um, eBPF programming using um, network traffic monitoring. So I thought, hey, if, if I can randomly drop some packets, this would be an awesome way to in inject some chaos engineering in a simple way. 
Um, and to show you that, I've written a small program because I figured there's a random, uh, random number generator available. Um, and wrote a small program which should show us that, for example, when I, when I ping localhost, we would expect everything is fine. So we have secrets number one, two, three, um, and when we stop it, it would say 0% packet loss, seven packets permitted. Now, should I, should I, Hopefully you can, you can see we have zero packet loss. Now I um, install a program and the thing it does, it, it compiles the code which I have over here. So like the random number and if it's greater than five, I drop the packet, otherwise I pass the packet. So this is like the simplest form of chaos engineering. Um, and this gets loaded as an eBPF program onto the loopback interface. And when I do my ping again, I hopefully get to see that the sequence number is one, four, five, seven. Uh, oh, it's a great random seed. Maybe it's also the, uh, the demo. Oh no, actually we had the lucky number of 15. Um, and if I close that down, I have uh, 74 something packet loss, um, which was like, okay, maybe in the future, either we have our own chaos engineering tooling and way label, or observability tools will make use of eBPF chaos, like to verify the observability um, data collection to some degree. And um, I created this demo last Thursday, so I couldn't get much further, um, but it, I think it could be a way for future chaos engineering also leverage, leveraging the power of eBPF. Um, but eBPF is not only in production, could also be in CI-CD deployments, like tri triggering an application error, verifying everything DevSecOps and observability, and it brought me back to quality gates, which I talked about one year ago already. Um, and I think to some degree we will like see production, but also CI CD deployments and everything else with eBPF. Um, for everything with eBPF sounds amazing, but there are also risks and thoughts. Like, how do I test these programs I'm writing in C or in another language? Um, what is the code quality? Maybe we can test that. There's a verifier. The code sometimes looks a little obscure. Um, what about security scanning for these types of programs? Um, and also, it's like a way to detect when something slows down the kernel. Um, maybe there's a supply chain attack again happening when someone uses eBPF for malicious activities, which people already do. Um, because the risks are your rule on the kernel level, you can do anything. And other people also exploit that in the sense of, hey, we have eBPF security observability. Yeah, but we can read the source code and we can like circumvent that and bypass that with different programming structures or race conditions or whatever. So it's a cat and mice game. And there are certain limitations of eBPF security enforcement, um, which should be kept in mind. Um, for a wish list, probably the most one or the most loved one should be an eBPF program which observes the other ones and tells you what is going on actually um, being loaded in the kernel and also like getting started or getting a better understanding of eBPF. And Liz Rice wrote a great book about learning eBPF, um, which, which can be helpful to dive deep even more and, and get an idea what you're actually using. Um, which kind of brings me to the end. So I think eBPF chaos is for everyone. You're using eBPF probably already. Some cloud native environments leverage eBPF under the hood. Um, what I learned on my journey is you don't need to understand everything. So if you say what Michael told me now about eBPF is way over the top, I don't understand it, it's totally okay. 
I feel like it helps to understand the technology when things are breaking. Um, but if everything works fine and the toolings, the tools work, it's, it's also totally fine. Um, I think from a benefits perspective, observability-driven development and auto-instrumentation will help developers. We can use reliability verification with chaos engineering, and hopefully we can also increase the Kubernetes security defaults in Kubernetes and other environments. To do the verification, I need to discuss or like bring the ideas upstream for chaos experiments, um, yeah, and everything better programming. Um, okay, yeah, this is the copy of the slides before. This is me again, and now we're done. Thanks. So we have three questions. Um, the first one is: Are there are there any plans? Uh, to substitute the current implementation in GitLab um, with eBPF rather than Jaeger? I cannot talk about the specific plans. <laughs> um, Why not? <laughs> <laughs> um, the thing I'm researching the most is like, does eBPF make sense for us? Like in, uh, or like, if I want to use that technology in CI/CD in my deployments. Um, I think Jaeger for collecting traces and like storing them in, in ClickHouse, which we implement in GitLab uh, for observability. This will stay for the for now. Um, but if, for example, eBPF would us enable to collect uh, observability data in a Kubernetes cluster, um, and I as, or you as a user don't need to do anything about it, this would be awesome. And part of my research is like also providing that feedback to our product and engineering teams. And if you say, hey, I totally want that, I'm a GitLab user, please also jump in, create a feature proposal, tag me in there, so DNS me here in, in GitLab issue works, um, and we can like figure out how the future will be. Got it, thanks, Amir, thanks a lot. Um, so the other one is, what is the runtime impact caused by observing with eBPF? This is a tough question, I guess. The thing is, since I'm not like the vendor who like creates the product, um, I think it's hard to say. I know I, I would say there is a certain slowdown, and I've, sometimes I read numbers like in this environment it's 10 percent, in this environment it's like 15. Um, to some degree, I would recommend like saying, well, for example, when Cilium is telling you the slowdown will be something like this, trust the vendor or go to the vendor, or read about it, and also benchmark that in your environment. Um, so if it's like slowing down for some reason or hitting some kernel obscurity bugs, things, say, okay, this is bleeding edge. We stay uh, stable in production and eBPF will be planned in three years' time or something because enterprises just, yeah, you need a stable environment. You can't yeah, just it. break it. Last question that we have, uh, at least on Slido, is what is the workflow to deploy eBPF programs into my Kubernetes nodes? Can I deploy them in a pod? Yeah, you would deploy it in a daemon set, for example, so it's loaded on all nodes. Um, but then it's, it's also like it depends um, how the Helm chart or the operator like is built. So when you install Cilium, you, don't, you won't see how the eBPF programs are loaded. But if you're interested, you can like dive in and, and get to see how, how things are getting installed. But by default, um, and this is my strategy, I look how other tools are implementing it in the CNCF landscape and then get, get to figure out if I want to create my own eBPF program just follow their path, the best practices. Awesome. If I can add my own question, um, what would be the risks, if you know about, um, by deploying many applications in a Kubernetes clusters that leverage eBPF? Is there any drawbacks, issues, slowdowns, or whatever? I think to some degree it's dependent on um, the kernel versions you're using on, on the nodes. So some, some eBPF features or things you want to leverage on a more higher level require kernel 6.1 6 or whatnot. So it's not like 4.7, which is sometimes listed as a minimum. Um, it could become, to some degree, a performance issue if not if something goes, goes wrong. 
Um, I do know that there are certain ways, like, so loading an eBPF program requires the kernel to load it, to compile it, to verify that, which kind of takes an amount of time, and there are strategies to have a static verifier somewhere, because currently you cannot really test eBPF in, in CI CD. You need to start a virtual machine, load it in the kernel, and do something. And, and I'm hoping that this gets aligned to testing it there, and the kernel just load something and it's much faster. And I could imagine this could increase the performance even more. Got it, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your talk, it was very interesting. Please a big round of applause for Michael again. You